Today it's a golf course, but 200 years ago, this field was the site of a bloodbath. In the late 18th and early 19th century, Mackinac Island was of vital strategic importance to the colonial powers of North America. Any merchant or military ships hoping to go from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron, or vice versa, needed to pass through this small channel of water. Whoever controlled Mackinac controlled the fur trade and held the key to domination of the Old Northwest. Mackinac Island was like a bouncer, checking for IDs at the door to a bar. If you didn't like the cut of your jib or the colors over your mast, then you weren't getting in. At the outset of the war, it was the Americans who were the masters here. But pretty much as soon as word of the outbreak of war reached Ontario, a group of British soldiers decided to take the initiative and seize Mackinac for the empire. On July 17, 1812, Captain Charles Roberts led a force of 46 redcoats, a handful of artillerymen, 200 fur traders, and 600 Native American allies to the north side of Mackinac. The army marched across the length of the island completely undetected. Reaching the heights overlooking Fort Mackinac, the British artillerists fired a single shot into the fort. The American garrison led by Lieutenant Porter Hanks was taken totally by surprise. At that point, they didn't even know that the United States and Great Britain were at war. Hopelessly outnumbered and faced with an enemy on the high ground, Hanks surrendered. This easy British conquest was the first major military action of the War of 1812. Lieutenant Hanks was later court-martialed for his surrender and imprisoned in Detroit. When Detroit came under attack later that year, a British cannonball crashed through Hanks' cell, decapitating him. It was an ironic and ignoble end for a man who only wanted to save American lives. The British must have fully expected an American counterattack because they built this fort on the same high ground that had gained them victory. Fort George here, later renamed Fort Holmes, commands the highest point on Mackinac Island. Though it was two years before that American counterattack came. On July the 26th, 1814, American ships appeared offshore and attempted to bombard Fort Mackinac right up these heights. Though they really only succeeded in destroying some gardens that were right here in what is today Marquette Park. Though the British were most certainly daunted by this sudden lack of fresh vegetables on the island, they nevertheless kept calm and carried on. On August 4th, an army of 700 Americans under Lieutenant Colonel George Krogan disembarked on the north side of the island, very close to where the British had landed two years earlier. This time, the Redcoats were outnumbered. British Lieutenant Colonel Robert McDowell had only about 300 men at his disposal, split between regular troops and Native American auxiliaries. McDowell did not wait to be attacked. Instead, he marched his troops north to face the Americans in the field. McDowell placed his regulars in the British center on a small ridge, then concealed native warriors in the woods on his flanks. As Krogan approached with his men, the Redcoats opened fire. Exposed as they were on open farmland, the Americans made pretty easy targets. Seeking to exploit the advantage of his greater numbers, Krogan made a terrible mistake. He sent Major Andrew Holmes and a detachment of troops to attempt a flanking maneuver on the British left. Holmes ran straight into a unit of native auxiliaries. He was ambushed and killed along with 13 of his men, in a short but bloody battle. Unprepared for the ferocity of British resistance, Krogan sounded the retreat, and the American invasion of Mackinac ended in utter failure. Mackinac Island remained in British hands until the end of the war, when the Treaty of Ghent gave it back to the Americans. The battle's greatest legacy today is probably as one of the most humiliating defeats in early American history. Now, Americans, we don't, we don't like to be beaten. It makes us very uncomfortable. We would rather celebrate great victories like the Battle of New Orleans than dwell on crushing defeats like Mackinac Island. It's just not part of how we see ourselves, how we would like to be. I guess we just kind of have this image of Americans of that time period, you know, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, as being Mel Gibson with a tomahawk in the forest, but it really just wasn't the case. Some talk of Alexander. 